Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Subtext Podcast Archives. These are the long lost episodes of the Subtext that were originally produced between 2015 and 2017. In 2018, the Subtext moved to American Theatre Magazine, and we've been producing the pod there monthly ever since. These time capsules are being shared here in their entirety, including plenty of outdated references and advertisements for events far in the past. If you enjoy them, please subscribe to the current podcast feed for the subtext or stream new episodes on the website for American Theatre Magazine. Thank you for listening. It was the day before college graduation. We were all congregated in the basketball arena for a sort of rehearsal. Four years of college was coming down to these final moments. My friends and I were kind of giddy. We felt almost like adults. Our apartments were lined up. Some of us, not me, had jobs already. I had no idea what I was even doing the following week. I had my family in from Florida and New Hampshire and Colorado. Everybody convened at this small Washington, D.C. college to watch me graduate the next day. We were going to have dinner together as soon as this rehearsal was over. Will the following students line up at the table marked with the sign, Questions? Did they just say my name? What's this questions table all about? I guess that's my first question. I break away from my friends and make my way through the crowd. I probably have to pay a parking ticket. I certainly don't owe a book at the library I never visited. You don't have enough credits to graduate, they tell me. How is that possible? I know I'm a philosophy major, but I'm not that bad at math. You're two credits short. I should be one credit over. Let me see. You received an F in 19th century British literature, so you received no credit for that class. An F, a, a, a motherfucking F. But Brit Lit was Dr. Mandanis's class. I specifically took it for the easy grade to take the pressure off my final semester. This must be some sort of mistake. I bolt out of the gym and run across campus to Dr. Mandanis's office. As I ran, I thought about what could possibly have happened. I missed a bunch of classes, but she never took attendance. This was what we liked about her. I phoned in assignments and the final, but it's a literature course. There's no right and wrong. It's all a matter of opinion, right? In a springtime Christmas miracle, Dr. Mandanis was actually in her office. I introduced myself and asked if I could come in. She seemed to have no clue who I was. This could be a good sign, right? Uh, There seems to be a mistake with my grade. What's the mistake, she asked. I guess you gave me an F, and now I can't graduate tomorrow? Hmm. She paused for a moment. I read possibility in her eyes. This could be a mistake, and she could clean it up. Let me look at my grade book, she says. You know, I knew I didn't nail my assignments perfectly, but I turned them in on time. I got a C on the midterm. I tell her these things as she scans her grade book. You missed class on January 23rd, January 30th, February 17th, March 1st. She went on and on. I missed a lot of classes. And she took attendance? What the fuck? She was supposed to... This was not the class I signed up for. After rattling off all the days I missed, I said, "Uh, Despite missing those classes, I thought I did enough to pass. I wasn't even believing the words coming out of my own mouth. Let me look at your final. I have it right here. Oh, God. I don't want to do this anymore. Please don't. She reads portions of my final out loud. It was garbage, and I knew it. She didn't have to tell me that, but she did. You put no effort whatsoever into this class, she says. You're right. I'm sorry. These were the only sincere words to fall out of my mouth. I started to think about making up this class, or not, and if I deserved to graduate from college at all. I started to think about what I was going to say to my family, who were waiting for me at a restaurant. What do I do now? I look toward the exit. Is this the only thing keeping you from graduating, she asks. Yes. Dr. Mandanis looks me in the eye for more than a moment. She sighs. I haven't breathed in seven minutes. I'll pass you, she says, but don't embarrass me for doing this. Make something of your life. 
Yes, 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 of course. Whatever you say. I thanked her a thousand times. I ran out the door and across campus as fast as I could before she could change her mind. It was long after dinner with my family and the graduation ceremony the following day when her words began to echo in my ears. Make something of yourself. Make something of yourself. I've spent the past 18 years trying to do that. Not to make Dr. Alice Mandanis proud, but... I guess to prove that a second chance is a gift worth giving. So, I'm trying. What does it really mean to make something of yourself? I ask, I ask that question all the time as I write and submit plays and hope for productions. But what if they never come? Does that mean I failed? Would Dr. Mandanis be ashamed? Should I be? <sighs> This episode is from my old professor, not because I think doing a podcast is any great achievement, but because, just because. Welcome to The Subtext, the Playwrights Talking to Playwrights podcast. My name is Brian James Polak, I like non-sequiturs, and I wear a size 10 and a half shoe. This month, we interview playwright slash director Marja Lewis Ryan, whose play A Good Family is currently running now at the Lounge Theater in Hollywood. I guess not now, if you're listening to this way in the future, but whatever. This month's episode is sponsored by Geffen Playhouse. Don't miss Rain Wilson, starring in the one-man play Tom Payne, based on nothing, at the Geffen Playhouse, written by Will Eno and directed by Obie Award winner Oliver Butler. Tom Payne concerns the life of a tragic and hilarious character. The New York Times calls it a treasured night at the theater. Performances begin January 8th. To learn more and to purchase tickets, visit geffenplayhouse.com. I've heard whispers about Rain Wilson wanting to do the show for a while, and Will Eno's work isn't done very often in L.A., so I'm pretty excited about this production. Hey, before we get into the interview... I want to ask that all of you listening right now with access to iTunes, go find the subtext page, rate the show, and leave a comment. I'm not sure what that does exactly, but it will definitely make me feel good. What other reason do you need? And while you're at it, tell your friends to listen. Say it's like getting a flu shot, only your arm won't hurt for the rest of the day. Okay, it's nothing like a flu shot. Just help us spread the word. Thank you. Now on to the interview with fellow three-name theater maker Marja Lewis-Ryan. Let's see. So I was telling you before when we were just sitting down how uh, you're such a stranger to me. And I think that it's actually kind of exciting to to talk to somebody who is a total a total stranger. Uh, although what I didn't put together um, until very recently was that I had seen your work directorially before I saw your play that I went to the other night. Because you directed the that Mammoth play. Mm-hmm. The Anarchist. Yeah, The Anarchist. And... Uh, and I remember having this thought because I've been working in I've been working in LA theater for many years, and you just feel like you know everybody, or at least you recognize everybody. And uh, and I was like, who's this Marja Lewis Ryan person? <laughs> I've been around a long time. Um, I started producing at Theater of Note in two thousand six, um, so I'm, I've I've been I've been active in the LA theater community. I was nominated for my first ovation in two thousand eleven, so it's mm-hmm. a pretty long time ago. Yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've been around uh, around right. a minute. My eyes have just had have, have had blinders. <laughs> um, I think it's a lot to do with the fact that I don't work with anyone else. Yeah. I work, I produce, write, and direct all of my own stuff on my own, so I don't my network if you want to call it that is very limited <laughs> right so. so you you did the anarchist though uh, which did. was not your work right right so how did that come to be i i um okay so i went to nyu and i studied at the atlantic theater company which is mammoth and macy's theater company in new york and um when i put up one in the chamber I cast the guy who played the dad Robert Bella is a founding member of the Atlantic Theater Company so Mamet came to see that play and uh, afterward he was like hey kid that's a good, good fucking play um, <laughs> need your help and I was like what and he like, called me a couple months later and he asked me if I would direct the anarchist and I was like yeah of course um, and then the, the exciting I mean that was exciting in and of itself but um, and then he's like, oh, great. My friend Flick, I will call you in an hour. And I was like, okay. And like, I just didn't ask who that was because mm-hmm. I was like, I just felt like whoever it was, I should know that, you know, it was like, I, I just, I just a lot of self doubt in that moment. 
And then like an hour later, I have like a number, you know, call from like an, a blocked phone number. And it's like, hey, this is Felicity Huffman. I hear we're doing a play together. And I was like, Flicka. <laughs> you don't say. So he had the team. Yeah. So he brought up. everybody on. Exactly. And all I did was step in and, and direct it. And um, it was a blast. I mean, uh, one of the things that I love about like my theater life is that I, I really do things like on a fucking dime i mean mm-hmm. i'm cheaper than anyone you'll ever meet mm-hmm. and so like we rehearsed in her living room for you know like two and a half months <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh it was great it's like when you're 11 years old and you like have you like turn your living room into a play set i mean it, it was that basically right but that is, although that is a play <laughs> that is suited for this sort of thing yeah totally right? totally yeah um but uh the, it was um it was a blast. It was really fun. It's uh, it's incredible to work with people who you admire, um, who have no, um, uh, they're like egoless in terms of like taking notes or getting better at the thing. Like they don't care who's giving them the mm-hmm. note. If the note's good, they're stoked. They want to trust the person who's talking to them. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they and and it it was it was such a um, it was a pretty extraordinary experience actually working with those people. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was that. So you did see that. I did see that. There I did go. see that. I mean, it's a tough play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super tough. So anyway, I went to see A Good Family. And uh, it's really exciting to see a play by somebody uh, you don't know. So you're, you're, you're meeting them and you're meeting their work for the first time. Mm-hmm. And you're getting to know uh, uh, at least this angle on their aesthetic, because it's not like every single play is exactly the same. It's oh, they're almost exactly really? the same. Um, <laughs> but, same cast, same location, same. But, uh, same but I don't know team. that, so right. I'm so all I know is what I'm coming, <laughs> what I'm coming to see, and there is this little bit of a uh, like you go in and you you want to like this person and you want to like the work. But it might not happen. Yeah, totally, you know? of course. And I was so happy that I did. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, it was a really fucking great play. And it was so surprising. Um, and there are moments, which is sort of what, you know, as a playwright, I want people to walk out and remember things. And not necessarily the things that I sure. want them to remember, but um, there are these moments that really, that really stuck with me. And one of them... Um, was actually a very simple moment, but it really had me going, oh, God, she really gets this sort of thing. Uh, and it was the the mother talking to the father about talking to the son. Mm-hmm. And that was so fucking real. Mm-hmm. That was so real. And it, and it brought up virtually every male relationship <laughs> I have in my entire life. Mm-hmm. All of the men. Um, and, uh, and I just loved that. Oh, thank you. That's a huge compliment. I really appreciate it. It's been, this play in particular has been really interesting to watch, um, like the gender divide of the reaction of the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't write like that. Like I don't, I don't, I'm sure you don't either. I don't, I don't think most of us do. Like I don't write and imagine what the audience will respond to. I just write the thing that feels right to me and then, mm-hmm. And then I watch, and it's really enjoyable. But the the male the male audience in this play has I've almost resoundingly heard that echoed that that feeling of mm-hmm. like that it felt really that that character and that moment and like that sentiment felt really real for mm-hmm. them. That like they it was almost like they couldn't figure out why the scenario felt so familiar without it ever having happened to them mm-hmm. and then when they heard that they're like oh because it could have mm-hmm. like they, you know it was like oh fuck mm-hmm. um but i think i well i didn't mention this on this microphone so i'll say that my dad's coming today and he's coming to the show tonight and um i mean that there's a line about monogamy and condoms that that's like what he taught his son Mm -hmm. and that is a real thing that my dad used to say all the time. Mm -hmm. And like when, when I got to college, there was a box of condoms in my duffel bag that he had packed me. And I was just like, I mean, which is wrong on so many levels, mainly (laughs) mainly because I'm a giant lesbian, but but he didn't know that at the time in his defense. But I, but I really remembered that. And I remember thinking like, so if you don't know I'm gay, so if you think I'm straight, like we've, we've never talked about this before. I mean, like you, that it just appeared at the bottom of a duffel, and I was like, oh man. And I really remember that moment, and I think it's like a pretty funny moment, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now, but 
but if you think about the implications of like what it could, you know, I don't know. So that, so that's that's basically where like those storylines come from, and that particular perspective is really clear to me because it, it's really my father's perspective. For the for people who are listening who. Um, don't know what we're talking about. Sure, Can yeah. you just give a little bit of context about the play? Of course, yeah. It is, um, it's a family drama that takes place in real time on Christmas Eve. And um, it's a very like traditional American blue collar family. And they're excited about Christmas. And then their son gets a phone call from the police station that he's going to be charged with uh, the rape of a girl on his campus. And um, it's basically just like a, an hour long look into how this family reacts and deals with the implications of that charge. Yeah. And I loved I loved that it was a moment and it was not, uh, you know, if you if, if somebody uh, distilled this down to calling it a play about rape, it, it is not it is not. Yeah, it no. is a play about uh, a really dramatic moment in a family's life and the and, and you're watching an hour long moment just play out and mm. and you're sort of seeing the f- the the reality of the situation and how it's slowly weighing down on each individual member of the family and you get to see this for the mother the father the sister the yeah. aunt and the and the boy who is the accused yeah and it's not about did he do it or didn't he do it and we're going to by the end of the play the audience, some of the audience is going to think he did and some like that's not even part of it. And that's one element I, I loved so much about it. It was about the family and the mother kind of brings it all together in the end, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I make, I'm fortunate enough to make a, a living as a screenwriter and there are certain things that you're not really allowed to do in movies, like write a 60 minute scene, you know? And, um, I love theater because it allows me time and just to think thoughts and feel feelings and it doesn't need nothing. I always say like nothing happens in my plays, but you know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not about the action really. It's not, it's not about the thing. It's not about rape. It's a, it, it's about just like an examination of a, of a family. I'm just, I mean, really interested in family dynamics mm-hmm. and, um, I, I'm really grateful to have a background in theater and like a place that I can exercise those <laughs> demons, you know, and uh, are you from a blue collar Midwestern family? No, I'm from, a, <laughs> you know, really, uh, hysterically funny. I'm Irish Italian from Brooklyn. And I think that um, <laughs> I think that my fascination with like white people in the Midwest is um, real. First of all, I'm very obsessed, very obsessed. I only write about them. I write about nothing else. Um, why? I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I really don't know why. But but when I like got, I mean, I just thought everyone was Jewish or Italian until I was like 22 years old. I swear. I mean, like I I had no like understanding of like what a non-Jewish German was, you know, like I thought mm-hmm. it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and I don't, I don't know. They, they like look very unfamiliar to me and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. It's, I, I really like the idea that like they don't want to be famous, like that they want to work hard and like send their kids to school. I don't know. It's just like a world that I just don't know anything about. <laughs> well, it's, it, <laughs> I can't, it, I can't explain it. I really can't. But it seems like you do. It seems like you're writing about people you are intimately familiar with. Like I don't, I didn't get the sense that you were uh, you're writing caricatures of, no, of no. Midwestern folks. No, no, no. When, when, when I when I say I, I love them, I, I I mean that like very very purely. Like there, I, I there's not a an ounce of judgment in my in how much I love them. I, I actually saw an indie recently. Um, uh, it's called Heartland. <laughs> I have nothing to do with it. I'm not plugging it, but <laughs> but uh, the, uh, this uh, they cast like a bunch of locals from Oklahoma, and their faces like you can just tell. Like I can just tell when I'm looking at them that they're people, and I'm just so much more interested in looking at them than I am in at looking at like a 
you know, an actor's face. So I don't can't describe it, but but it's that kind of idea, and it's also the idea of like just like what does realism feel like? And like my family does not feel real. We don't look real. We don't I, something about it's not quite right. It's like always a little moonstruck. You know what I mean? Like the, we're always like the film version of a family, but. I'm really interested in creating realism. I'm really interested in creating like true, true naturalism. Um, I love watching those actors. I I think it's so interesting that you look at your own family, (laughs) right? Like this is, Uh, this is where you develop your own normal, which uh, you're, you were just talking about, mm -hmm. about at age 22, you thought everybody (laughs) was Italian or Jewish. Uh, But now years later, you're looking back and you're like, Oh, that's the, it's the opposite. Like you've gone, it's the opposite. Well, because I, I didn't, you don't realize that you live in a bubble until you come out of that bubble. And then you're like, oh shit. N- almost no one has my life experience. I mean, like almost no one has the, the family that I have, but like to find the universality, like to find the things that make us all collectively sort of the same is really fascinating to me. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who um, has like a show that's about um, uh, like a Jewish family and, uh, she was like, do you think it's, do you think you'd be able to write like a, like a, from a Jewish family perspective? And I was like, well, my mom was just in town and the thing she kept saying was not that anyone cares, but I made coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the woman was like laughing. She was like, oh yeah. I'm like, so if you change like coffee to like latkes, then like you have a Jewish joke. But like, I was like, but what you're, I was like the tone that you're trying to find is mm-hmm. not a Jewish tone. It's a universal tone of a parent. I was like, that is what parents sound like. They say things like, not that anybody cares, but I made coffee. And like, <laughs> like it's like, what is that character? I don't know. That's just what my mother sounds like. I don't know. You know, you're completely, I just, you're not, you're, you're specifically and intentionally not writing about your family. And I now desperately want to, to see, my family. <laughs> I want to see a play about your family. I want to meet nah. your family. I want to get inside that family because well, it is, but it is and it isn't. It them. sounds it's, it's, very it's interesting. Both, it's both. It, 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 that's what I mean. Is that like I'm? I pull. I. I'm not explaining myself well at all. But it's like it's like it, if you pull from like a universal under. I'm interested in finding the universal moments in families, like uh, like very simple, very fast moments that make it feel real. Like when Heidi, when the lead actress says like, sit down, sit down, you know, uh, open your presence. And they're like, I can't imagine what it could be. Like, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. If that's Hanukkah, it looks like that. If it's Christmas, it looks like that. If it's your birthday, it looks like that. The mother saying like, you can return it if you don't like it, you know, and everyone gets that joke. Everyone's mother says. That. Oh, yeah. Everybody died in that line. I I know yeah. because because you because you understand and like you know when she goes to take a picture and she's like oh no no sit down sit down, sit down. it's a video it's a video it's a video that's not a that's not a a kind of person that's just what happens mm-hmm. it's just what happens sure um and like and and then I get into like nuance of like what kind of people they are but like there's a lot of things in there that are not anything they're not um. They're universal. They're, we all we all experience them on some level. So that's. I'm, I but you take that. you take all these universal things, uh-huh. these, these universal moments and ideas and yeah. lines and thoughts, and you package them in a midwestern right. family. <laughs> right. And I'm and I'm hung. I'm completely <laughs> hung up on the packaging yeah. and your choice of it. And and I completely want to psychoanalyze. I know. I mean, I, I I I'm I'm not opposed to figuring it out. I just don't know. I really don't know when I I um. It, my last play uh, that I wrote, um, it like starts with a, uh, a g- little girl like finds a snake and like off stage she finds a snake and she screams and she comes on stage and the mom goes and like gets like a double barrel shotgun and goes and shoots the thing. <laughs> and um, I, I was kind of, it's a, you know, as a playwright, it's a setup, right? It's like, it's like the gun I'm showing you at the first of the top. So like it's going to be used later. Mm. But but as an as a moment of like realism, like that really did happen. Like that really did happen. I lived in North Carolina for a year, and I was like on my way out the door with a friend of mine, and she was like, "Oh, shit, hang on a second. And she like had heard something that I didn't hear, like a scuffle or something, and she went and got her fucking double barrel shotgun, and she shot a giant black snake in her chicken coop, and she just she did it in heels. You know what I mean? Like like <laughs> like. <laughs> Like, this is not... That's brilliant. Uh, yeah, and I was like, oh, like, this is not... Again, I'm from Brooklyn. Like, 
I don't know double barrel shotgun. I don't know snake. I don't know chicken coop. I don't know. I don't know anything about the world that I'm in. And uh, but when you live, whenever I live places, I kind of like take the things that make it feel real. Um, and I don't think you can really know that without experiencing it too. But so anyway, so so all of my all of my families are like just kind of like bits and pieces of like my own life experiences and my own family, but always in this very uh, Midwestern suburban house. Were you writing when you were uh, still existing in that Brooklyn pre age 22 bubble? Mm. When that was, when that was what was normal to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think when I was 13, I wrote a play about a piano prodigy. I remember that. Um, but no, I, I never really, Mm-mm-mm. no, I, I grew up as an actor and I, I, acted all, mm-hmm. all the time no i really didn't write very much i didn't start writing until like my last year of college um yeah no i didn't <laughs> what why the why the did you did you stop acting or did you start to do both i started to do both when i first got out here my my first movie came out in 2010 and i'm in that so that's like the last oh and i was in my play in 2011 too mm-hmm. actually i just sm- like small part um I like acting, but I don't like the business of acting. So it wasn't quite for, right for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really like working with, I work with the same actors all the time. Heidi Salzman is in, has been in all of my, all four of my projects. Mm-hmm. She understudied for Felicity even. Um, and uh, I think that also may be a part of the reason why all of my plays take place in the middle of the country is because of what she looks like. Mm-hmm. And I'm like very fascinated by what she looks like. And she played the mom. Love, yeah. I love what she looks like. Mm-hmm. She just looks like a person. <laughs> I don't know. I can't describe. It. I just love. I love yeah, her. And, and, the, and the th- the thing is, it's hard to describe actors in this way without make without there being some kind of weird <laughs> veneer that can be interpreted as insulting in some way. Oh, no. You know, I know. But, like when I said she's a person, uh, even when I just said that, I was like, is that an insulting thing? To right, say? but it's so She'll not. Probably kill me. I completely understand where you're coming from. There is a. There is an uh, there is a, an appeal to it. Mm-hmm. There is a watchability mm-hmm. to that person. Oh man, she's compulsively watchable. I mean, I the opening of the play we start with her just putting things on stage and like singing Christmas carols. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I could watch that for an hour. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I just really like watching her. Like something is going on in that person's head at all times. Well, when you're writing realism and you're producing and, and presenting realism, mm-hmm. you want it to feel as real as possible, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is the way people look Mm -hmm. and i think Mm -hmm. we in los angeles do suffer from that a lot about this sort of like Mm -hmm. lack of real identifiable people on stage there's like and we see it on television all the time there is like this you know if you do a show oh yeah if you do a show that is about people in their 20s it is like the same 20 like group of 20 year old kids out of the Abercrombie and Fitch catalog <laughs> all dressed really the same and you're just like this is so inaccessible I know. like I know. who it's do like, I identify like, I've with I've never looked like that I can, right. I can guarantee and I remember growing up as a kid in New Hampshire <laughs> um, which couldn't be farther from this world and I was like I am not I am on the Goonies, totally. so I can identify with the Goonies. I can't identify with any of these TV shows. Well, you know? I mean, th- I mean that that's why shows like you know Freaks and Geeks, My So Called Life, Felicity. You know, like when you start yeah. to see shows like that, and you were like, "Whoa!" I mean, Felicity is actually even pretty polished, but not really, not compared to. I mean, and all of these came after my growing up years. Your growing up years, yeah, this I is was, all after you. I was like an old. Because this is by then. <laughs> I was like, I was like, that, that's that's what I grew up watching. I had the the privilege of growing up watching that. So like, I I had some touchstones, but um, but in terms of realism, I I you know I studied uh, well, obviously Mamet, uh, Wasserstein. Um, mm-hmm. that was like my direct my big directing project in college was mm-hmm. uh, the Heidi Chronicles. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I was like, that's sort of my sort of my speed. Um. Who else? I mean, and then there's some shows now, like Transparent, is like a sure, is like yeah. a s- strong example of kind of like my my aesthetic. That's about right, right? And that's a show that's cast really, really well, well. and really real. sincerely and yes. real, yeah. And it is so accessible, yeah. yeah. And it, and it, even though, and that's that's what's exciting too. And like that's what I hope to to be able to do as well. Is like once you I can identify yourself 
like as a member of this tribe, you know, that, then I can kind of do almost anything. It, like anything can happen and, mm-hmm. and you'll still be with us because you found yourself because you see yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm playing with that a lot too. Um, but I really, I mean, I, I, I always say like, I'll take credit for just about anything, but, um, <laughs> but I will have to say that the rehearsal process for this particular show was very, very, very short and so much, much credit is um, needed uh, in, uh, to the actors because uh, they, every time I watch the show, they like continue to find uh, their home. Mm-hmm. Like they, it feels more and more like her house. Kind of like every night I watch her come out, yeah. you know. You and may have opened, but they're still yeah. working the show. They really yeah. are. And it's like, and I love that about them. Like, I love that they really are still working the show. They're, they they don't go up there and give you, they don't phone it in. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. they're really there every night. And uh, I feel really grateful to have found a group of actors who are willing to invest in something that, like, is really just for fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? There's no like, there's no like upside of like doing this really well. You know, <laughs> is it though? Is this just? Do you think theater is just for fun? For me, it is. Yeah, yeah. it's just pure, pure fucking fun. It's like <clears throat> I like <clears throat> have like executives come in, like my bosses, and they just like see me in the lobby, and I'm like, I know, I've never looked this happy when we're working together. I know, I know. And they're like, <laughs> you really don't. I'm like, no. I was like, what we do is terrible, but this is fucking great. Like this, like, I mean, just doing live theater is like, I mean, there's nothing better in the entire world to me, honestly. Do you find joy in screenwriting? I do. I, I, I do. Yeah. 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 I'm, yes. I, uh-huh. but I like to make things. I'm, I'm, I'm really not, I don't, I don't have like any, I don't have anything unproduced. <clears throat> so like, I don't really get off on like writing something like it's, it's the end. I want to see it. Mm. I want to watch it. So that's also why theater is like so satisfying. So, um, th- this pat cause you don't know me so you don't know what follow up question to ask. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> Go. <laughs> the, the, so this last year, so I don't know if you noticed, but it, the my play is presented by Timur Bekmambekov, who yes. is like a big like Russian action director. He directed like Wanted with Angelina Jolie mm-hmm. and like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's directing the new Ben Hur right now for Paramount. And um, uh, he owns his own company because he's a big producer in Russia, and so. Um, he hired me to, I, I sold him a pitch, like, I guess almost two years ago. Um, and he came and saw one in the chamber as like a supportive person in my life. And he just came and then he asked me if I would go to little doms with him like the next morning. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I like sat down with him and he's like, look, you, you, you direct your own movie. Okay. Same as play stuck in box. And I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, he's like, yes. And also y- you will eat chocolate cake. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, he, and then he ordered me chocolate cake and I like, I like sat there and wrapped my head around that. So he let me direct my own movie um, this past year. And we were in post-production uh, in like the, the edit bay. And one of the producers like saw me writing outside and he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm writing a play. I just can't fucking take this movie's nonsense right now. And because it just takes so long and I'm like the least patient person on the planet. I'm so, so impatient. Um, like I did the anarchist while I was shooting that movie and mm-hmm. I did this play while I was in post. Cause like, I can't take it. I really can't take it. It's so, it's so slow. It's just so slow. And, and I, I just lose my mind. And, uh, and he was like, he's like, I would like to hear this play. And I'm like, okay, I might come to a reading. And so he came to a reading with my cast and he was like, I like this play. I, I'll, I'll fund. I'll give you money for play. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> like, God, this is like, like a dream. I, I know. Believe me. But like, cause he doesn't, cause like, I'm always a little afraid because he speaks another language that I'm like, I just want to make sure we're having right. the same conversation, you know? You understand what you're committing to. Exactly. For real though. Like, like, uh, like, cause I just want to make sure. And I was like, I was like, okay. I was like, so mathematically it's not possible for you to make this money back. Uh, do you follow me? And he's like, mm-hmm. I'm like, mm. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to take your money and I'm going to put it in a garbage can. I'm going right. to light the garbage can on fire. And right. he's like, uh, yes, <laughs> I make play before. <laughs> I was like, what? 
<laughs> and he's just like his back so then i find out that his background is in theater he started off like as a 10 year old kid his sister's boyfriend or something was like a production designer for uh, the, like a theater in moscow like a mm-hmm. huge fucking theater and he used to follow him around all the time and uh, so he began designing uh, sets on stages. That w- that's his intro into the world. And uh, so he loves theater and, and he loves making things. Like that's what he suffers from the same problem I do, which mm-hmm. is like, I just have to make something. I'm going to die. I cannot believe that this is taking so long. And um, he just loves it. And like he came opening night and he was like, Marcia, please, can I take a picture? <laughs> I'm like, it's your play, buddy. You can do it. You can stand up in the middle and curse if you want to. Right. Um, but it's just been so cool. And like, I love that people love what we do. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, (laughs) there's no, um, there's no glamor (laughs) in in anything about this experience. Um, and I just, he just likes it. Like he just likes, I love this man. I want to, I would, I want to meet meet him. I really do. I want to have chocolate cake at little Dom's (laughs) with this man. Yes. I make play before. (laughs) I know. I understand. (laughs) I'm going to. (laughs) Uh, I know. So, so when you're writing, so when you're writing a new play, you're writing, and you're like, okay, this play that I'm working on right now, when I'm done, I'm going to. Then- I call Raquel. Lerb- no, 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 no. I don't finish the script. I have an idea. I call Raquel Lerman. I'm like, when can I get space at the lounge? And she's like, send me the play. I'm like, I haven't written it yet. It's gonna be great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you're the worst. Um, and then she like gives me the dates, and then I just reverse engineer everything. So you write to opening, yeah, basically. <clears throat> uh-huh. Wow, we couldn't be more different. <laughs> I'm that writer that writes a play and spends a few, and, you know, years. spends maybe not years, but I mean, I'll come back to it over years. Mm. But I have a gigantic pile of unproduced plays. Yeah, that that pile just grows and grows. I and think grows. people think that I'm being dismissive because because I'm fortunate enough that people will ask me for things, and I'm like, I don't have anything, mm-hmm. and they're like, What do you mean? I'm like, I don't have any. Literally nothing. I have nothing. I have no nothing. No thing. <laughs> because like, people are asking for an unproduced yeah because they want to do like a world premiere and I'm like I don't have anything like that <clears throat> and I never will because because I have that's the other my background is so weird because like because I grew up as an actor but then the first thing I did was produce plays like I that was the, my f- intro into like well, like a theater of note I produced a few plays there you want to know a really good um, small world story yes so I graduated college really early I was like I just turned 21 and I moved out here and a friend of mine uh, was like you should join theater of note they make things all the time you'll be fine, mm-hmm. <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> they'll let you go make things and mm-hmm. I was like great and I loved theater of note I loved the people there and uh, I volunteered to like produce a play like right away and um we needed a I need to put together a team mm-hmm. and so we like took pitch meetings and the woman who walked I didn't know any of them at the time they were all grad students at UC Irvine but uh Megan Brown Amanda McRaven Karen Lawrence uh the entire fugitive kind mm-hmm. ensemble when all, all of those women came in and pitched as a group they were like she's like Amanda's like I'm the director and these are all of the people that I work with and mm-hmm. I was like hired and so i actually produced their first play in 2007 and it was amazing that's so cool what was the title of the play it was called famine plays wow by richard callahan and they just won the ovation award last yeah, year they both won megan won for writing amanda wrote one for directing right what was um, the name of that play uh it was um megan's um, um, um pliant girls right pliant girls yeah right. Um, and like, I mean, and now we see each other all the time and Karen designs for me to Karen, the, their lighting designer. I steal her all the time. Um, she did the anarchist. Uh, she's amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, I just, I love like, that's how small our theater community is. Right. Is like, right. I mean, we're now like working like, you know, uh, artists, but well, how long ago was that? Like 2007. Six, yeah. What year is it now? 2015. Like that's a long time ago. And I guess that's why I was remarking on not knowing who you were. Yeah, I don't, I don't play be- well with others. Because you've been around for, <laughs> for so, so long, long. And you've been consistently doing stuff. Yeah. Um, but I guess I guess part of that is part of that is because I've been, I work for the theater at Boston Court in Pasadena. And that's where I've been since 2007. But not doing my own work. Right, right, know? right. So my work hasn't been, me the playwright hasn't been work in the town right i've just been out watching things constantly that's nice though yeah it's nice not, but not you know gig. yeah I'm but you know when you're a writer things. like the whole point just like you were saying before is to get that fucking play 
realized on stage. Yeah. And there comes a time when that tower, a growing tower of unproduced plays is, it's going to fall down on you and it's going to crush you and you're going to die. I hope that that doesn't happen to you. <laughs> it's you're, going you're already to down a finger. You I know. know what I, mean? I know my poor, my poor pinky finger. Um, but, but I also, the other, the other reason why I'm able to like produce so, um, efficiently is because I do use the same people every time. Mm -hmm. Um, my production designer, and this is our fifth project together in the last, I mean, it's just as many years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, you know, it's like shorthand. I mean, he and I are like, just like look at the space and it's like, oh, okay, we need six flats of that size and four of those. I right, see, I see on Tuesday. It's like that. I mean, that's all. I mean, we you know, don't even there, uh, I commend your, your production designer because I'll see a million shows that are done for a dime. And there is a huge discrepancy between a show done for a dime and a show done for a dime with resources smart people yeah. who know how to well, make it, it work it, it really is it really does come down to the fact that we are all uh, like we all work in the film industry and so we just have access to things that you know is, is a little unfair <laughs> i mean I'll, I'll so you could you could you're able to borrow s set pieces and whatnot and also just like the the man behind the set pieces which is way more important than the set pieces itself i mean like you know I wouldn't. I couldn't afford him. Like if I had to, like pay, pay mm -hmm. that person. If I were like actually like a, if I were a better producer and paid anyone to do anything for me, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to. Aff I mean, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very expensive. Um, but uh, but he's my friend, and I'm fortunate enough to get him to come, like you know, work overnight for two days with me. It's just me and him. Yeah. <laughs> so your your father's coming to see the play yeah. tonight. Yeah. Um, I can't wait. Does he live in New York still? He, uh, yeah, just northern New York. He's like he's in Connecticut now. He's in Connecticut, mm -hmm. with the, which is northern New York. Right? Yeah, just just slightly. That's just the, the first train stop. That's the part of New England that New England disavows. Yeah, that's right? true. <laughs> Having it's grown true. up in, in New Hampshire. It's true. Um, I see maps. I see these maps every year whenever it's like Red Sox, Yankees or Jets, Patriots. And they always talk about where's the line? Where's the line of support between yeah. like who's supporting which team? It's kind of funny. And I mean, I'm on the doing the Patriots, Boston Red Sox side. Obviously, right, obviously. I'm right. I'm sure there's no mincing words. there. No, there isn't. No. There isn't. You're kind of weird if you support. The Giants or Jets or Yankees. Yeah, that would be strange. When I was growing up, my, my grandfather used to pretend that um, he hated the Jets so much that he couldn't say the word. <laughs> and so he would be like, he'd be like, it's the Giants versus the the ch the ch I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens with me. I don't know. Elaine, please. The, Turn uh, the, the phone down. The owner of the Jets owns the gas station chain Hess, I think, Hess oh, gas station. Yeah, and we so, used to get Hess trucks every year, too. And for years, I wouldn't use that gas, I wouldn't buy gas at that gas <laughs> station funny. because for some reason that mattered. That mattered. It made a difference. It's, you know, if I you, don't, <laughs> if I don't buy five gallons of gas here, it, maybe he won't be able to, whatever. It's you're, all, like, it's also, you're like, right? It's you're also like, dumb. that track? That's I have to say, I'm happy to have, uh, to have grown up and have my sports teams do some winning so I can stop caring so much okay. because uh, I spend too much time caring about sports and uh, I didn't come to theater and the arts until much later in my life. And part of it was because of the, the distraction of sports growing up. Hmm. Um, and I really wish I didn't care as much growing up. Well, I you must have been caring for the both of us because I definitely don't know anything about <laughs> sports. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. What about this your is, family? This is a classic line when I would say something like, I'm not the lesbian you want me to be right now. <laughs> I say the same thing when there's a critter of any kind around. Right. I'm also not the lesbian you want me to be that either. <laughs> I can work some power tools. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what kind but of mostly what? set related. You know what I mean? Like not for real. I can do almost anything for fake. You know? Right. Um, so yeah. what kind of lesbian are you then? Um, oh God, not a very good one, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, for all the, like... <laughs> But like the strengths that we should have, I don't think I have very many of them. But that's okay. I'm a, I'm a, I like art. <laughs> that kind? Is that a kind? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just not, the, I'm not the kind that I would like to be. Like the kind that can k kill a bug or <laughs> a cat or know a, know a sports team. So da dad gave you a box of condoms when you went away to college. Mm -hmm. When did he realize that uh, I told him, he wasted $25? Yeah, totally. To his defense, he didn't. They weren't wasted. I had friends who needed <laughs> them. So I'm sure they were used. Um, uh, I came out when I was t 20, 20, 
Maybe. Um, I I had a girlfriend in high school. I mean, I, I was out, but not to my parents, I guess is what I should say. Uh, I came out to my parents when I was 20. And my uh, is pretty classic Ed Ryan because uh, uh, he raised me. Uh, it was just me and him. Um, and I had a girlfriend who would come over all the time and spend the night all the time and but you know he's like a guy and he's like that's just what girls do i guess but it's not true by the way in case there's any parents if you have a 17 year old daughter who has one friend who's coming (laughs) over all the time that is not what girls do okay they just do not it's not true uh and like that's good advice it's good parenting advice um it's free too um, and then, so I, I called my dad and I was like, I was prepared to come out to him and, uh, I asked him if he would, I went to NYU, he still lived like right there. So mm-hmm. I was like, can we meet for dinner? And he was like, sure. And then I hung up and then I, I called him back like a half an hour later and I was like, by the way, I'm not pregnant. And he's like, oh fuck, thank God. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. But I'll still talk to you tonight. Cause I just knew that that's what he thought I was going to say. And you knew that he was never going to just know. Fuck no. This is a person who like, this is one of his like classic favorite stories about like his own like density. But like he, he would like go to the office and he would like listen to like these guys in the office, like bitch about how like. You know, I was like, oh, my daughter's like wearing this like short shorts to school and my wife thinks it's fine. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, oh, God, I can't believe my kid's leaving the house looking like that. And my dad's like, God, my kid wears like baggy jeans and work boots. I'm nailing this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And I, I love that he thought that it was him. He was like, I'm doing something very well. You know, like, <laughs> he's That's geez. brilliant. I know. And. Uh, and so I, no, I, I knew he, based on that story alone, I mean, you know, that person's never, he, he was just so happy I wasn't pregnant. That was his like number one thing was mm-hmm. don't get pregnant. He always said that. What's the four year plan? Don't get pregnant. That's right. But it was always the four year plan. It was never like the three year plan after those four years, you know? It, so you said, good. dad, this is how far I'm going to not, <laughs> not get, get pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> totally. And, and he was just delighted by the whole idea. He was like, because, yeah, because it's just a permanent birth control. It's great for him. <laughs> he was really excited about it. Um, but, yeah, and even after when I came, when I came, he was fine. He was, he was surprised, but which was surprising to me. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he's fine. He's totally fine. <laughs> Did you say, listen, I was a 17-year-old girl bringing my... Yeah, and I was like, you, I'm like, really? I'm like, you never thought. And he was like, never. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, what are you going to do? I can't argue with that, I guess. Um, yeah, no. He's just thrilled. Just thrilled by the whole thing. My mom's fine, too. Um, yeah, but he's coming today. I'm very excited. Does he see all your work? Oh, yeah. Yeah? My mom came and saw the play ten times. Wow. And I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I keep having to convince people I'm an adult. Uh, (laughs) especially because but but it's for them too it's like it's i think it's hard to understand like what what a right like how a writer is employed i think for a lot of people it's like kind of confusing like if i say like i do rewrites on a job or like i sold something like doesn't mean anything really it's like it's never gonna get made so right it's an idea in the air that exactly it's like that's how i pay my rent but like it's not i have nothing to show for it beyond the roof over my head which is like lovely i'm not complaining but it's i think hard for my parents to understand like what i'm doing and so like these plays at least are like a thing <laughs> you know it's like a thing to come to though like i'm doing this thing right now so that makes them happy i think do you ever do you talk to them a lot uh, almost every day do you do you articulate your work to them ever or oh, do you yeah. just let the work stand for itself like do you talk about this is the thing i'm working on here's what it's about um, how in, how interested or invested are they in your very my 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 mom's my mom's an artist and author of children's books so i have like that side of my brain from her and then my dad is like a very traditional ed ryan i mean his name is like he's perfectly named Mm -hmm. he's just like a guy you Mm -hmm. know he's just such a guy um and uh but he is like he fancies himself a patron of the arts you know he's like really interested in what i'm doing Mm -hmm. but he doesn't like get it i mean he thinks it's like a miracle <laughs> you know? that it happens yeah he he. i mean it's like magic to that him. it goes from your brain and then yeah. he sees it fully realized yeah 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 he thinks it's like a well, m- an actual miracle it kind of is, is it? i think it is yeah i mean there's something really magical about it i think it's really magical when like an actor walks into a room and like says your lines and you're like it's even better 
than it was in your own head. Like, mm-hmm. There are some moments of like our jobs that I just think are so uh, it's magic. It really is. It's just magic. There's nothing. I don't know what else. Well, it sounds it. like one of the smartest things you've done is hold on to these people who just you get, get and they get you yep. in the words and them and their brains and your brains. They all just sort of work. Yes. Together. And I also I do a lot of workshopping. So so my process, so I write very, very, very quickly. I don't want to tell you how quickly, but extremely quickly. Mm-hmm. And then immediately. Immediately, I sit down with them and I, we do a, ta- a whole week of table work and it's not table work from as a director. It's table work as a writer and I fix, I, ch- I change everything to make mm-hmm. sure that it sounds like the words coming out of their mouths because even stuff like, um, uh, very simply, but like Alec, the kid who, who plays the boy in my play, mm-hmm. he's like, guys don't really say, oh my God, that many that often mm-hmm. and i'm like oh fascinating <laughs> like just things like that just like just to like bring authenticity to like right. a 20 year old guy it's like those kinds of and then there are bigger changes than that obviously but like but but that's the kind of like specificity i'm dealing with when i have these people because i trust them and they trust me and um and i always i say things like I'm not going to fix that one. You know, like I'll put my foot down about a couple of things because I'm like, nah, nah, go try harder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're like, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the dad in particular has some lines that he was like, I can't believe he would say this. And I'm like, just lean in for a little while. I'll fix it if it really doesn't work. But he has lines where he says things like, um, I wonder if we could pull him out of that school. I wonder if we could get our deposit back. And he was like, I can't believe he's talking about getting his deposit back when his son was accused of raping someone and i was like my dad would definitely want to know if he could get his deposit but back. yes i <laughs> i understand the the actor impulse because that is a that is a, a thought process that you need to lock into mm-hmm. but when but there is such a level of authenticity to it it felt like a non sequitur, yeah. but it's supposed to be a non sequitur. Because yeah, he's in his own head. Yes, we are supposed to be, like, we, the audience, are supposed to be jarred in that moment. Like, but he's not. Exactly. Are you, wait, are you serious? serious? We're <laughs> supposed to have the response that he, the actor, is having exactly. in dealing with the script, we are supposed to exactly. experience. Correct. And so, yeah. and so, and that's what I mean is like, is like, it felt uncomfortable for him to say it, but I was like, yeah. It's supposed to feel uncomfortable to hear it. it. You know, once you find it, yeah. it won't feel uncomfortable for you to say yeah. it anymore. It'll be uncomfortable to hear it. And and there's a difference. As opposed to the oh my God note, which I think is actually mm-hmm. the right note. And like, it would sound weird if we were hearing that, but we wouldn't really know why it would sound weird. I, I don't think. I don't, because we're not that. Right, it wouldn't ring true. Uh-huh. It's something about I just wouldn't. Right. Just, would sound strange. Yeah. Um, but it's such a small moment. We would just pass over it. Over. We would exactly. just have like a weird like ringing in our ears. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Or, or, that, or you would end up getting, uh, cause a lot of, cause I'll get notes like he's underdeveloped or he's inconsistent. And then, and then you figure out like, what is the note behind that note? <laughs> you know? And it's like, Oh, it's really just these 12 things that 20 year old boys don't say. So do all, does all of your sort of like uh, dramaturgical response come out of your actors? Do you have other people I do. I have a. I have a, an amazing manager and I, and his former assistant, who um, just left recently. But she is like way too over, way overqualified to be an assistant. Mm-hmm. Obviously, um, is the first problem. Um, but she, uh, the two of them, just give me like incredible notes. Um, they're very good at their job. So I have the two of them, and then I have my actors. Yeah, but I, but I actually write um, uh, by recording. My own voice. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I like act out the whole scene. At, like all the characters in the room. It sounds insane. I I keep looking at my phone because it's on my phone. I right. could play it for you. I won't because right. it's way too embarrassing. But it it does actually sound crazy. I mean, but I, I've, crazy. I mean, know, like certifiable. I think I mean. if you said this to me uh, a month ago, I would have been like, "Oh, that's kind of nutty." Mm-hmm. Uh, let's move on. Like, right. <laughs> but because I have, uh, for those of you listening who can't see me, I have had surgery on my right hand and, uh, because I, uh, I suffered a tendon in my pinky. So my right hand is completely immobilized and I'm right handed. Uh, I can't write right now. And it's, and it's kind of killer because I'm, I'm the type of writer who writes every single day. Mm-hmm. I wake up every single morning and I write for at least two hours before I go to my day job. And I haven't been able to do that for a few weeks now, and it's killing me. Mm. So I've I've started to think about what are other ways I can yeah. get the stuff out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started to think about 
putting on my my headphones and just speaking into this the That's microphone exactly and recording into my phone. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what I do, and the reason why I do it is not because my hands don't work, but because I because similar like you have a day job, like so do I basically, and like my job is to write, and it, I have to stare at a computer screen all the time, or mm-hmm. I'm like directing a feature, and like I'm in front of like a fucking you know edit bay all day, and. Uh, walking like i just need to like go outside and like make sure that the sun still rises and sets and uh that's when i write my plays is like just i go for walks and just Mm -hmm. with them um and i can't imagine what the neighbors think i really can't i mean i mean crazy i mean i'm sure i just look insane are you performing is it is it performative totally yeah i'm like complete i'm acting out every single character and it sounds like different people which is the thing that that's that's actually what's scary about the recordings. I know it's really creepy. Yeah, I would love I, I would I would so love to have like a companion video to go along with this episode where it's just like it's like a minute of just like we're we're spying, walking down we're the spying on you and your arms are flailing like a lunatic. Like a lunatic. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. Mm-hmm. It's troubling, I'm sure. I'm sure. But for me, it's just the best. I hope at least one person listening to this is like, is that's like, who that oh, is. Totally, totally. Oh, we do. We cool. Do. <laughs> we do. We do. Oh, man. Yeah. But uh, it's it's really helpful. And it just like expedites the, you know, my already insane uh, way that I make my plays, which is find the space first and then write the play second. Um, but Raquel Lerman and uh, Victoria Watson at Theater Planners have been co-producing with me since forever Mm -hmm. so they're used to me now (laughs) do they uh do you invite them into the process i don't (laughs) know enough because i don't like them because i do actually like them very much uh no it that's what i like no these plays are just for me like i don't want to i can't handle a boss like i can't i just can't and like uh, one of timor's like executives like was trying to give me notes on my poster design and I was like, listen, I'm going to need you to go fuck yourself about this. I was like, I, ca- I cannot have any notes about my poster design. I just can't. I was like, you can give me notes all day about that movie. But like, I, ca- I know. Just please let me go make a play with my friends. Um, he told me I can make more, too. <laughs> oh, yeah? It. Yeah. You guys, oh, we found a real patron. You did. I really <laughs> you got really lucky. I'm really lucky. I know. I know. I know. I, f- I, I know. I feel very, very fortunate. Um. Yeah, it's it's really lovely. So, <laughs> well, the, so we, what we've cracked open is really the secret to getting your plays produced, and mm-hmm. that is to find a rich man, a rich Russian, Russian, movie preferably director. with a background in theater, if you can. Right? Yeah, but they all seem to have some kind of <laughs> background. In sure, theater, sure, and they're all over the place. Yeah, there's lots of them. Find them you on Craigslist, probably. <laughs> you can find them. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's really kind, and and the other thing too that's really uh, impressive, I think, is like. You know, a lot of people talk about the problem. This is actually something I do want to talk about more so than want to plug the show. Um, uh, The idea of not enough women do what I do and uh, that there aren't enough roles for women. And all of my plays are about suburban housewives um, and their families. And um, uh, he really loves that because like one of there's like a couple of like uh, Russian stories that are like very much like these female centric domestic like stories of domesticity and he's like when he when he first heard my plays he was like uh Marja, do you know Chekhov <laughs> <laughs> i'm like yeah i've heard of that guy how's how, what's he been up to he was a doctor right <laughs> and he's like he's like there's a Chekhov um festival in russia i think let's take play there to russia the russians will love it <laughs> i was like will they he's like oh yes I'm like okay, so I'm curious to see to see if Russians like this play. Um, uh, but anyway, but back to the women thing. So so the, uh, we hear a lot about like groups and like mentors and like you know supportive ways that we can help each other. But like the definitive way to actually help the problem is to hire women. I mean, the, mm-hmm. it's just that simple. And what I love about him is that he doesn't really identify a problem but he always but he keeps hiring me (laughs) and i'm like you're solving this giant problem actually you're like really helping to solve this problem and he's like okay 
So more, he's like, he's just like, it's, it's completely lost on him because he doesn't care. I mean, not, I mean, not that he doesn't care. I just, that's not why he's hiring me. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I can tell, but he also is aware that I'm really interested in women's issues and he seems perfectly fine with that. I, I just feel very fortunate. That's why I'm talking about him so much. Uh, he's really, he's Santa Claus. Um, and also on, I did a very bad job hiring women on my last feature. So I really tried to make up for it at least during this play. And I did really well. My only, I have a male production designer, but I have a female assistant director, uh, three producing partners that are women, and my stage manager, my lighting designer. So you mean when you were hiring your team yeah. to support the film, yeah, you didn't, I didn't hire enough well. women? Uh-uh. I didn't hire it. What, do you think this is because this is your first? Was this your first feature? No, um, it's a, my first feature I directed. Yeah, but no, I mean it's it's pretty inexcusable. Honestly, I, I think about it a lot. Um, I'm like not looking forward to like standing on a stage <laughs> during like the festival circuit. It's mm-hmm. going to be very embarrassing for me. But um, but yeah, I, I I don't have any excuse. I I just dropped the ball pretty hard. Um, uh, yep. <laughs> Is this a, is this a feature that you wrote? Mm-hmm. You wrote, wrote directed, directed it. yeah, and he produced it. Um, yeah, it comes out uh, in March. What's that one about? It is. Um, so, did you Unfriended was a horror movie that takes place on a desktop, mm-hmm. and so it he made that movie for like a million dollars, and he's they made fifty eight million dollars at the box office. So he's like, oh, movies just like this, and so he put out a call for like uh, for. Um, like outside of that, sh- like outside the horror space, if like something could work in this format, mm-hmm. and um, I pitched like a modern day teen comedy based on Cyrano de Bergerac, mm-hmm. but instead of having a big nose, he has a small dick. Mm-hmm. So he was really into that, and um, it all takes place on his desktop, basically. So it's like a bunch of you know, so like so t- you take like the idea of like a Greek course. And I put them on, I put like three girls on like Google chat Mm -hmm. and then I have like four, three guys on Google chat. So it's like this Greek chorus in the beginning. It's like very much structurally exactly the same as Cyrano, but he doesn't die at the end. (laughs) Spoiler. Spoiler alert. Um, But yeah, so uh, that, that, um, it was really hard. It was really hard. (laughs) It was really, really hard. The post-production process is really long because it's like 90% computer animation, like uh, screen capture. Um, and you're in the room for all of this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And Writing having my ne- and having never directed mm-hmm. a feature before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you lock into the process of directing a feature if you've never done it before? Mm. Well, I, I mean, I I wrote and produced a feature when I was pretty young and affectionately pretty much a ding dong. And uh, but I am smart enough to watch, you know. I I'm I'm pretty observant, so um, I picked up a lot doing that. Um, I shadowed uh, a bunch of people. I've shadowed Maggie Kylie on a feature. I shadowed a commercial director on a commercial. I I shadowed. Hmm, I called Michael Matthews. Give Michael Matthews a shout out. So you've been <laughs> aspiring to direct. Yeah, for a minute. Um, yeah, I was just like looking for the right thing, um, and I knew that directing theater was the right way for me to go because i'm really into like rhythm Mm -hmm. i'm really into pace that's like the most important thing to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) more way more important than any emotional anything that happens on that stage um and uh uh, so that that was like where i felt most comfortable and this that movie was actually a pretty nice segue because um there's no movement, right? It's like everything that's shot is like a locked off camera. Mm-hmm. It's all on like Skype. It's all on like Google chat or whatever. Um, so we shot on five cameras that were like uh, linked directly to one another. So we shot live mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm like watching five monitors like in a, in like a production suite as it's happening and I'm on a God mic, just like the one I have right now. And all of my actors have earpieces in. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like rewriting things, I'm like rewriting things. As yeah. going. I'm like tuts, and like someone sneezed. I remember one time, like someone say bless you. Somebody say bless you. Somebody say bless you. And they're like, bless you. All of them, like all at once, you know? Um, but it was lovely. It was like really, um, uh, challenging, <laughs> really challenging. Um, but that is part of the reason why I did have, I think a bunch of guys is because my first feature was a bunch of guys mm-hmm. cause I brought them all with me on my second so that I felt like I was padded kind mm-hmm. of on all sides. Mm-hmm. Um, my DP, my AD, my editor, 
um, they're all, you know, 30 year old straight white men mm-hmm. who like, went to Harvard. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I mean, they need work. Well, that, and then that Those became the running men. joke. When people would come in, I was like, is he 30 year old straight and white? God, let's hire him. He doesn't have a job. Oh, what are we doing? Guy's coming out of Harvard. Uh, I feel so bad for him. Oh my God, uh, <laughs> employ him. I know. So, I mean, we, there was nothing else to do but like laugh about it at a certain point, but it is pretty um, embarrassing, really when I think about it. <laughs> but I do love those guys, P.S. Um, they're very good at their jobs. So maybe they do deserve to work. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Well, that's the thing. Everybody deserves I know. It's to work. hard. It's really hard. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tough... It's, it's, it's not quite as simple as it seems in a lot of ways, but... Yeah, but then no, but it is really. It's just about hiring people. It's but about not everybody, right? Talent. Everybody, everybody deserves to work. Not everybody has the same opportunity and pathways into the jobs, and that's what I know. But I do, and right. I'm the hirer, so it is right. my responsibility. Right. Yes. Right. It, well, it is. It's your responsibility. It's yes. and it's everybody else's responsibility to be locked into this as an issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's what I think. Yeah. It's all my fault. I so think here's my resume. I'm I'm not 30, but I am straight and white. <laughs> You're in. Hired. <laughs> Hired. Um, yeah, but this is this has been exciting. I mean, I I really I can't speak highly enough about what uh, like LA theater has done for me. People ask me all the time, like, why are you a playwright that was from New York and moved to LA? But like, I never thought I was a playwright. That was not what I. That's not what I really. Do, but do you identify as a playwright? I hope so. I hope I'm like doing it justice. I don't really know. I I, I just I don't. I, um, mm. <laughs> I, I think I make things, you know, like I, I really do make things. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not interested in other people directing my stuff. I'm not interested in directing other people's things mm-hmm. unless there's like something to it that's like really extraordinary. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in producing other people's work. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I just want to like make my own things and like live in a cave or something. But we like live in a so. city where people need to be introduced in really short pithy ways so we can we can understand the entirety of you in just a few words right isn't that what la is all about i think i think that if, so this is my friend marja she's, she's a writer director that's what i i mean that's what i am i'm a writer director but then somebody says that you're like but it's so much more complicated than that no i say like, i'm a writer director and they're like what do you write for and i'm like everything where people talk mm-hmm. that's what i say that's what i do <laughs> so uh write a director marja what are you writing directing now um I, well, what's I coming my up plays my plays open right now it's called a good family so the lounge theater um yeah, uh, closes december 20th <laughs> um and i have a feature that's in post uh hopefully premiere in march um that i wrote and directed i have a uh a couple of like television deals that I write uh, that I'm writing right now. Um, and I have like a couple of features that I'm shooting in 2016. Do you <laughs> it's ha- very unspecific. Do you so. have, yeah, but that's the way Sorry. it is, right? When the, biz- when, when there's money involved, know, it has to be like so, so dumb. but you can be, you don't have to be so uh, vague when it comes to theater, right? That's right. Do you have other ideas that are I stewing do. in the brain? I do. I have. I have. I have two more plays that I'm definitely going to write before I die. Um, God, I hope. I mean, that's going to be a million years away. I hope you write more than two more plays. Well, I'm, but I might not though. That's the thing is that I, I really only write them when I can't take it anymore. You know. So, that's probably so right. Hopefully, hopefully at some point I'll like find some peace in my in my like you know television film world. So. What's one of the two? Can you say? Um, yeah. So, so I, I told you I grew up as an actor, and right. um, Heidi, the woman who's in all my plays, she like when she got off stage opening night from this play, she was like, "I got a proposition for you." I was like, "What?" She's like, "You're going on stage," and I was like, "When?" I was like, "Not in this fucking play." I was like, "What?" Mm-hmm. I was like, "Does a Jewish aunt come over?" I was like, "What?" I was like, "Who's who's who am I in this family?" Um, the neighbor. Yeah, exactly. The nosy neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Um, but even then, I mean, do you buy that I'm from Missouri? No, you don't. <laughs> you do not buy it. Um, anyway, and she was like, no, we're going on stage together. You're going to write us something. And I was like, well, what world do you and I exist in though? And then I thought about it for a half a second and I was like, oh, prison. <laughs> she was like, oh. and so I told her that I fell asleep that night and I could just hear her voice in my head saying, Saying the line, I don't even know what the play is about. This is the line that I hear, though. I hear the line, if you get any extra fruit cups, save it for me. 
<laughs> That's all I could hear was something a line about fruit cups. And I was, she's like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what the play is. But so oh, I'm going to do a prison God. play. And uh, and I'm also going to do like a uh, like a psychological thriller set in a dysfunctional family setting. Mm-hmm. It's going to be great. That's my next one. That's the one that's going to go up this summer. And where is this family going to be living? Nebraska? Yeah, I have to make it up because it's actually based on a true story from a Russian, mm-hmm. believe it or not. But I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to put them somewhere. Yeah, I, I, Nebraska's good. Uh, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, because I don't do accents. Because mm-hmm. there's nothing I hate more than watching a cast of actors try to do an accent. Butcher an accent. Yeah. Butcher the shit out of an accent, right. even though they, they claim they're doing it. I'm like, you're not. You're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not doing it. I promise. Um, yeah. How about that? Was that good enough? That's good enough. That's good enough. But I don't accept that there are only two. In uh, in a couple of years, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna poke at you and say how many more? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, I want to make a lot of money, and like this is definitely not the way to go about doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. But you have a long way to go. It's you like have a long career ahead of you. Thanks. It's like my running joke is that I like you know make money for six months out of the year and then blow it all in a play. <laughs> <laughs> but it but it makes me so happy. That's not a bad. No, no, bad I know, life. I know. I'm li- yeah. living a charmed life right yeah. now. Like, believe me, it's not lost on me. But it, I'm just so grateful that there's like an audience for whatever the fuck I like. I'm just compelled to put up. Like, that's really what it is. Is that like no part? No one's asking me to put up these plays. <laughs> no one's like. Right. No one's like. God, you know what? We could really use some more of your plays. Um. So like every time we do this, it's like really just because. I love it. But they're good and nobody's telling you not to. Oh. Right? Nobody's saying, Marja, you've done enough. Mm, some people are saying. Well, they're jerks. <laughs> Honestly, some people do say that. Well, they're jerks. But, well, thank you. Um, but I love it. So uh, just know that, I suppose, that like that's that's really what's like behind everything that I'm doing on those stages is it's just this smiling face on the lobby. I just like I'm so excited to be there. <laughs> And I do run my own box office, so you'll see me at the lobby. Too. I did. It was. It was. I was impressed. Is it funny? Yeah, I know. Um, do you want one more story on the way out? Please. Okay. So I did bring tell us you home. That, that David Mamet came and saw my first my play, one in the chamber. But w- the story I left out is the story that uh, the Atlantic Theater Company now tells their incoming freshmen. So here's the story. So I really do run the box office at my own plays at the Lounge Theater. And uh, this one night, this is a year ago, year and a half ago, um, we were having like sound issues for some reason. Like the levels weren't right or something. And my stage manager was like, can you come in here? And there was nobody in the lobby. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So I go into, <clears throat> I, go, I start to like go into the theater and then David Mamet walks in. It's like 7.10 for like an 8 p.m. show. And I'm like, what the dick <laughs> is this person doing here? I've never met him before, but like I know, I know what he looks like. Right. And I knew he was coming, so I was like very prepared. And he's like walking up, and I'm like, "Oh fuck, I gotta like deal with the sound issue. I'm, like, what am I gonna do right now? Like, I can't just leave him sitting here." And then like, so I'm like, "Hang on a second to like my stage manager. I'm like trying to figure out like what to do with my body in space. And then like someone else walks in, and I was like, "Well, I guess I can't really leave the box office. Is the real problem." And so I like turned to this stranger who I've never met before, who happens to be David, because I'm such a dick. I really am. I'm so, I'm so insane. But she, I said, excuse me, sir, w- would you mind sitting here? I have to go <laughs> do a sound check. And he was like, oh, you know, it would be, it'd be my pleasure. And so David Mamet is sitting at my box <laughs> office and I'm like, here's a pen. I'm like, when somebody walks in, I'm like, just cross their name off and just hand them this program. And he was like, so just cross their name <laughs> off, hand them off. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I like go inside. I'm like dealing with the sound issue, which ends up being a much bigger problem than we originally thought. And I have to like reset all of the levels for like all of the sound cues. And as I come out, there's like plenty of people in the lobby. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, Last name? Thank you. Thank you for coming to the theater. And he's like handing these fucking people programs. And everyone's like looking at him. And like you can see in their face, they're like, I'm sick. <laughs> I, but how and why? And no. And so, and so I come out and I'm like, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. That was not supposed to take that long. He's like, oh, it's really thrilling, actually. And I was like, 
great. And he, and I was like, I wish I had uh, like something to like repay you. And he was like, well, do you have any gum? <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, I, I do. So I handed him a piece of gum and he went back and sat with his very, very kind wife who was like sitting there just like shaking her head the whole time, just like completely amused by the whole situation. So then the, and then the punchline to the whole story is that at, for our opening night gift for the anarchist, I got him a shirt that says uh, Dave box office manager. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's that's my this that's is, my story. This is the first time I've <laughs> cried in one of these uh, interviews. Is that, is that, is that like edit, an insane edit, story? Edit, edit I mean, happening out of laughter. I'm, well, I'm happy to make you laugh. I mean, obviously, like it says a lot about me that like something's definitely not quite right with my head. But like, it says a lot about him that like it's the same feeling that I'm expressing, right? It's just like a compulsion to do things because like we love it so much and that we love every single part of the thing. Like the, no part of making this play is a burden or a chore to me. It's like everything is like really fun to me. <laughs> and like, and like that is something that I think that all theater makers really share. And like that to me is like a perfect example of that. It know, is. And I can't think of a better way to end. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. That was Marja Lewis Ryan. Her play, A Good Family, closes December 20th at the Lounge Theater in Hollywood. If you're hearing this in time, go see it. On to the thank yous. Thank you, Bill Bordy. His generous financial support helped LA Stage Alliance launch At This Stage magazine dedicated to illuminating, 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 that's not even a word, dedicating, dedicated to illuminating the performing arts scene in Los Angeles. Check out the website thisstage.la and find lots of excellent articles, interviews, photos, cartoons, and the archive of this podcast. Thank you to John for recording this episode, and thank you to Danny Oliver for bossing me around. If you haven't already, find us on iTunes, subscribe, leave comments, rate the show, and all that good stuff. Tweet us at Subtext Podcast. Email us, thesubtextpodcast at gmail.com. That's all. You've reached the end of the show. Next month, our guest is Chewbacca, who will be sharing his thoughts on the 2016 election. You'll be surprised to learn whom he's supporting. Bye. Bye.